No other military technology is as daring as the attack tank. They are truly an underrated behemoth of war, navigating through the harshest climate on Earth with nearly impenetrable armor. This marvel of modern military technology is simply irreplaceable and unmatched. With the ability to withstand a temperature of minus 70 degree Fahrenheit, navigate through snowstorms, hail massive cargoes, while still providing a comfortable accommodation for its crews. How powerful are these tanks exactly? What impact do they have in modern warfare? Join us as we explore the capabilities of Russia's newly improved insane attack tank that conquered Antarctica. Before today's advanced military arsenals like fighter jets and aircraft carriers, for instance, two historic land vehicles explored Antarctica, which were America's Arctic snow cruiser and the Soviet Union's Kharkovchanka. Both of these attack tanks aim to navigate Antarctica's tough terrain for scientific research. While one of the tanks failed and was lost forever, the other succeeded and is still very much in use. Now let's get into history. The United States Antarctic Snow Cruiser was designed in the late 1930s as a unique exploration vehicle which had its own aircraft. On April 29, 1939, Poulter and the Research Foundation of the Armour Institute of Technology presented their plans to build a sophisticated tank in Washington, D.C. And after much persuasion, the foundation agreed to pay for the Antarctic Snow Cruiser, estimated at $150,000, and oversee its construction. Construction started on August 8, 1939, and lasted for 11 weeks. On October 24, 1939, the vehicle was started for the first time near Chicago and began its journey to Boston Army Wharf, covering 1,640 kilometers. During the trip, a broken steering system caused the vehicle to fall off a small bridge on the Lincoln Highway into a stream near Gomer, Ohio, where it stayed for three days. Its arrival in Boston caused a major traffic jam. It eventually departed for Antarctica on November 15, 1939, aboard the USCGC North Star. When the snow cruiser reached Little America in the Bay of Wales, Antarctica, with the United States Antarctic Service Expedition in early January 1940, it encountered many problems. A ramp had to be built from timber to unload the vehicle, but one of the wheels broke through it during unloading. Despite cheers when Poulter powered the vehicle free, it struggled to move through the snow and ice due to its smooth, treadless tires designed for swamps, which spun freely and sank into the snow. The crew tried attaching spare tires and chains for traction, but found driving backward provided more grip. They even drove 92 miles in reverse. On January 24, 1940, Poulter returned to the United States, leaving Dr. Franklin Alton Wade in charge with a partial crew. They conducted experiments while living in the snow cruiser, but funding was canceled due to the focus shifting to World War II in the United States. Also, without proper testing, it proved impractical in the Arctic, and the Second World War War led to the end of the snow cruiser. In the 1950s, the Soviet Union began their own Antarctic research, and the first Soviet expedition arrived in 1955, establishing the Mirny Station in 1956. They found their track tractors inadequate and needed a new vehicle that could handle the harsh conditions and provide safe, comfortable shelter for the team. That's how the Karkachanka was created. The new vehicle was based on the ATT heavy artillery tractor, which used the chassis and drive system of the T-54 tank. This gave it an advantage over the Arctic snow cruiser, which had failed due to its unsuitable wheels and tires. The massive vehicle was over 13 feet tall, 11.5 feet wide, and almost 28 feet long. One interesting detail was the size of its cabin. It was nearly the same size as a studio apartment and could fit eight people. Also, the exterior panels had multiple layers of insulation. Inside, there was a small kitchen, bedroom, restroom, and vestibule, along with the driver's and navigator's control section. It also had a separate workshop laboratory, making it a mobile lab. The cockpit had access to the engine, the fuel was located under the floor in the center, and the heating system was in the back. The kitchen had an electric snow-melting device and an electric stove for heating up canned food. Since the crew couldn't go outside in the freezing temperatures, the vehicle was essential for their survival. But despite how efficient and comfortable it was, 
this attack vehicle underwent several upgrades, making it even better. In 1974 to 1975, a second generation Karkovchanka was designed and built for Antarctic use. The main changes were moving the cab and engine to the front of the large rectangular body and adding auxiliary power for electricity and heat when the main engine was off. Also, there was an improved five-speed gearbox in a turbocharged diesel engine with over 900 HP helped the vehicle perform well, even at high altitudes. Its Caterpillar tracks could handle icy terrain and soft snow, and its chassis was waterproof, though not amphibious. It could travel at a top speed of 6.8 miles per hour and could pull one or two trailer sleds weighing up to 77 tons. In 1956, three fully equipped Karkovchanka vehicles with trailer sleds arrived at the Mirny station. Two of them, along with an ATT tractor, made an incredible 1,678-mile journey to the South Pole. Some expedition members later recalled this unique but challenging experience in their memoirs. The Karkovchanka accomplished without any problem what the Antarctic snow cruiser had only dreamed of, and it also continued to serve in Arctic expeditions for many years without a hitch until it got upgraded. In 1975, the upgraded Karkovchanka II replaced the original and is still used in polar expeditions until the last of them were retired only a few years ago and is now standing as an historic monument at Progress Station. A third generation was planned for the 1980s, but the dissolution of the Soviet Union ended that plan, similar to how the Second World War had ended the U.S. snow cruiser project. However, while this powerful tank was being used in Antarctica, Russia also invested in a new tank, the T-34-76 tank, it was a medium tank used by Russia in the early years of World War II, starting in 1940. It was highly effective on the battlefield because it had a good mix of firepower, armor, and speed. Its main gun, which was 76.2 millimeters, was better than what other tanks had at that time, and its strong, sloped armor made it hard to destroy with anti-tank weapons. When the Germans first encountered this tank in 1941 during their attack on the Soviet Union, they were surprised by how good it was. A German general even said it was the best tank in the world. But as technology continues to advance, Russia has in its possession an even better attack tank that is even better than the Karkochanka and the T-34-76 tank, the T-14 Armada. The Armada is a Russian main battle tank based on the Armada Universal Combat Platform. The Russian army initially aimed to acquire 2,300 T-14s between 2015 and 2020. However, by 2018, production and budget issues delayed this plan to 2025. And in July 2018, it was announced that the main production run might be canceled. Despite these issues, in 2021, the Russian TASS-S news agency reported that the Armada was expected to start mass production in 2022, with a test batch of 100 tanks to be delivered to the Second Guards Tominskaya Motor Rifle Division that year. The tanks would only be officially transferred after passing all state tests. In December 2021, the Russian company Rostik announced that mass production had begun, with over 40 Armada tanks expected to be delivered to the troops after 2023. On March 4, 2024, Rostik CEO Sergei Chemizov confirmed that the T-14 Armada had entered service with the Russian Armed Forces. It was first seen publicly in March 2015, loaded on train carriages in Alabino, and was officially revealed during the Moscow Victory Day Parade on 9 May 2015. During the parade rehearsals, one tank briefly stopped but resumed movement after about 15 minutes. At least seven T-14 tanks appeared in the 2015 and 2016 parades, and five in the 2017 and 2018 parades. Four were expected for the 2019 parade. State trials of the T-14 began in early 2020, with reports in April that it had been tested in combat in Syria. In July, testing of an unmanned version, Tachanka B was announced. In November 2022, reports indicated that the development program was halted due to the financial impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. However, videos and photos of tank training in Kazan appeared on social media that month. On March 4, 2024, Rostik CEO Sergei Chemizov announced that the T-14 Armada had entered service with the Russian Armed Forces. On 25 December 2022, 
Russian TV presenter Vladimir Solovyov shared footage of the tank in combat training. With reports claiming the tank was ready for battle and already in the conflict zone, likely near Kazan. Later, on the 25th of April, 2023, RIA Novosti reported that the T-14 Armada had been used to fire indirectly at Ukrainian positions, but had not yet been used in direct combat. The tanks were given extra protection and their crews completed combat training. It was absent from the Victory Day Parade on 9 May, raising doubts about its combat readiness. On 19 July 2023, TASS quoted sources saying the T-14 had been tested in frontline combat by Russia's Southern Battle Group but was later withdrawn. Official information about its deployment was not released. On 4 September 2023, TASS reported that the T-14 was withdrawn from Ukraine after being tested in indirect fire rolls with added side protection. However, in March 2024, Rostik CEO Sergei Kemesov confirmed that the tank was never deployed in Ukraine because it was too expensive, and the T-90 was deemed more efficient. The Armada tank was designed over five years and features innovative characteristics like an unmanned turret. The crew of three sits in an armored capsule at the front of the hull, which includes a toilet. The tank's armament includes the Vacuum 1 armor-piercing, fin-stabilized discarding sabot round for the 2A821M gun, capable of penetrating 1,000 mm of armor at 2 km. It also fires the new Technic HE frag shell and guided missiles like the 9 mon 19 m one INVAR-M and the 3 UBK-21 Sprinter anti-tank guided missile, with ranges of up to 5 km and 12 km, respectively. Also, a 3 UBK-25 active homing ATGM is under development. The secondary weapons are a 12.7 by 108 mm cord machine gun with 300 rounds and a 7.62 by 54 mm R Pecheneg PKP or PKTM machine gun with 1,000 rounds, all remotely controlled. Interestingly, an additional 1,000 rounds can be stored separately. The 152 mm cannon developed for the T95 prototype features a high speed APFSDS shell. However, Russian engineers have maintained the 125mm gun, enhancing its effectiveness with improved ammunition. The T-14 may also be equipped with anti-aircraft missiles and a 30mm anti-aircraft gun in the future. In August 2022, Russian media reported on proposed new features for a future design by the 2030s. These features include a system integrating the tank with a dedicated reconnaissance drone, a 151mm main gun, thermobaric and supersonic armor-piercing ammo, 152mm for the gun, ATGM with fire-and-forget capability, improved target detection and identification at over 6 kilometers, and a redesigned turret and autoloader to accommodate the 152mm gun and ammo. During the prototype stage, various engines with power outputs from 1,500 to 2,000 horsepower were tested. The 1,500 horsepower version allowed the tank to reach a top speed of 82 kilometers per hour. However, the tank is presently powered by a CHT ZO 12 and 360 diesel engine with a 34.6 liter displacement, delivering up to 1,500 to 2,000 horsepower. The engine can theoretically produce up to 2,000 horsepower, but this greatly reduces its lifespan. At 1,500 to 2,000 horsepower, the engine can last at least 2,000 hours, and at a moderate 1,200 horsepower, it can last up to 10,000 hours. The engine is electronically controlled and gives the tank an operational range of over 500 kilometers. The T-14 also has a 12-speed automatic gearbox, allowing a top speed of 80 to 90 kilometers per hour. Some sources suggest it may have a partly or fully hydrostatic transmission. Unlike previous Russian and Soviet tanks like the T-90, T-80, T-72, and T-64, the T-14 has seven 700 km road wheels on each side, similar to the T-80 variant. This design might improve the tank's pivoting ability. An active suspension system enhances target lock time by 2.2 times and reduces the reaction time between target detection and response by 31%, resulting in a smoother ride. The main armor of the T-14 is made from a new type of steel called 44 SSVSH, which is very durable and can handle extreme temperatures. 
This steel is 15% lighter than the steel used in older tanks. It also has advanced composite armor that includes a ceramic layer and explosive reactive armor built into its design instead of being added as extra bricks. The sides have additional armor in the front two-thirds and slat armor in the rear one-third. Its crew of three is protected by an internal armored capsule. The tank has the Malekit dual ERA system on the front, sides, and top of both the chassis and turret. It uses a computerized control system to monitor all functions, analyze threats, and suggest or automatically take action in battle. This system can also detect and correct crew errors when not in combat. Production of the tank's ceramic armor began in mid-2015. The tank's features the Afghanit Active Protection System, which combines both hard kill measures, destroying incoming threats and soft kill measures, disrupting guidance systems. The Afghanit uses a radar to detect, track, and intercept incoming anti-tank weapons, both kinetic energy penetrators and tandem charges. It currently intercepts targets moving up to 1,700 meters per second, with future upgrades expected to handle speeds up to 3,000 meters per second. Although it provides 360-degree protection, it does not defend against top-attack munitions. Analysts believe that the Afghanite sensors include radar panels on the turret for a 360-degree view, with a hard-kill element to destroy incoming projectiles and a soft kill element to confuse ATGM guidance systems. Some Russian sources claim the hard kill APS can even counter depleted uranium rounds, but others are skeptical. Practical tests reportedly confirm the destruction of uranium projectiles, but independent verification is lacking. This system also includes launchers that fire electronically activated charges, which might be high explosive fragmentation or more solid warheads to intercept threats. The tank is also equipped with a system to protect against attacks from above, using steerable cartridges and a VLS on the turret top. It can destroy incoming missiles and slow-flying shells with its AESA radar and anti-aircraft machine gun, except for kinetic energy penetrators. In July 2015, a Ural Vagonzavo deputy director claimed the T-14 would be invisible to radar and infrared detection due to radar-absorbing paint and the placement of heat-generating components deep within the hull. However, experts doubt these claims, suggesting that modern thermal technology could still detect the tank. Based on experiences from the conflict in Ukraine, in August 2022, the Russian army requested improvements, including increased detection range for APS, better shielding against RPGs and ATGMs, enhanced electronics protection against electromagnetic and microwave weapons, and a new system for remotely deactivating landmines. The T-14 tank has an advanced radar system and secure communication channels connecting it with other T-14 tanks and command posts. The commander and gunner use similar sites with multiple imaging capabilities, including thermal and laser rangefinders. The commander's site on top of the turret provides a 360-degree view while the gunner sight on the left of the gun includes additional features for targeting missiles. Both sites can detect tank-sized objects up to 7,500 meters away in daylight and about 3,500 meters at night. There is also a backup night vision site with shorter detection ranges. The driver uses infrared and zoom cameras, and the tank has a 360-degree camera system for full visibility since the crew is positioned at the front and would otherwise have limited vision. While the T-14 is mostly Russian-made, some parts, like night vision components, might have been sourced from other countries due to production challenges and sanctions. In 2016, a new Russian-made night vision system, the Urbis K, was tested and could identify targets up to 3,240 meters away both day and night, addressing previous shortcomings compared to Western tanks. An unmanned version of the Armada tank called Tachanka B is currently in development. In 2015, Vladimir Kozhin, a Russian presidential aide, stated that countries like China and India are interested in buying the new military equipment showcased at the Moscow Victory Day Parade, including the Armada tank. China's Norinco company claims their VT-4 tank is more reliable, has better fire control, and is cheaper than the Armada. As of August 2020, Russia also mentioned Vietnam, Egypt and Belarus as potential buyers of the T-14 tank. 
By 2016, the T-14 Armada had become a major concern for Western armies, with British intelligence noting the advantages of its unmanned turret. However, there were doubts about Russia's capacity to produce modern tanks like the T-90 and T-14 in large numbers. In response, the German company Rheinmetall developed a new 130mm tank gun, which they claim is 50% more effective than the older model. Germany and France are also working together on a new main ground combat system to compete with the Armada and replace their current tanks by 2014. Thanks for watching. While you are still here, click on the link on your screen to check out another of our videos. See you there.